This morning we're going to read out of Matthew, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 14. We're going to study about what Jesus says about the Sabbath. So in our lesson today, now we're going to pass on from Jesus' special instructions to his disciples and to John the Baptist that we've been talking about previously. We're going on to another topic, and the question over the Sabbath is what we're going to talk. It's that sabbatical question that's been a, uh, an argument and still is and probably will continue on until Jesus comes. But in our lesson today, for those who have ears to hear, Jesus settles this question and in so doing, he did not abolish the Sabbath, he only restored it to its true place and its true purpose. It's a necessary service to mankind. It was made for man to improve his spiritual and eternal good. It was not meant to violate or profane or to be a day of mere idleness, but to be a day to improve man's spiritual good. One day out of seven, just one day, for man to particularly prepare for eternity. And true Christianity will exist only when the Sabbath is observed as God commands it to be. And he says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's in Exodus 20 in the 8th chapter. The question is, what is the Sabbath? And what is holy and what is not holy? So, here today in our lesson, Jesus will teach us the right use of the Sabbath and on what day to observe as the Sabbath. So, Father God, I just pray now that you would anoint our ears to hear and that we would, we would understand and, and begin to observe the Sabbath as you would have us to do as a holy day unto us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in this lesson, we'll see the Sabbath question addressed in two places. On the outside, in a field around Capernaum, and then again on the inside of a synagogue, as Jesus settles the Sabbath question, vindicating it from the law, and some of the superstitions, uh, some of the superstitions and notions that had been taught by the Jewish teachers showing that the works of mercy, the works of necessity, are absolutely to be done on that day. So let's begin our lesson and read together the first two verses, verses 1 and 2 of Matthew, the 12th chapter. And at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered, and he began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Now remember, Jesus is on his way to the synagogue to worship with his disciples because it's the Sabbath. And on the way to the synagogue, they were led through fields of grain. Now the word corn here could apply to wheat, rye, oats, or barley, explaining the fact that they rubbed it in their hands to separate the grain from the chaff. And we're told that the disciples were hungry. Why were they hungry? Well, because they were following Jesus. They had been ministering, they'd go, been going about doing good, and they didn't always have time and take time to sit down and eat regular meals, or even to sleep, as they should. So at this time on this day, as they're going to the temple to worship on the Sabbath day, they were, they were on their way to the synagogue, and to satisfy their empty stomachs, they just simply grabbed ears of corn or some kind of grain, and they rubbed the kernels of grain loose so they could at least have something in their stomachs. And some of the Pharisees saw them. Now you know that we remember that the Pharisees were forever spying on Jesus, forever spying on his disciples, forever trying to accuse Jesus or his disciples of breaking some of their law. And this Sabbath day especially, they were on spy duty because one of the main causes of the criticism of Jesus 
was concerning this question of keeping the Sabbath. So at this time, one of the most distinguishing features of Judaism was their strict emphasis on observing the, observing the Sabbath. And the 24th chapter of the Talmud was devoted entirely to their laws concerning the Sabbath. They had built up a, a very high wall around this simple and help, helpful day. Sabbath laws of Moses, they'd added to it many, many childish restrictions of their own, all revealed in the Talmud. For instance, if they had lumbago and rubbed their aching bones with vinegar and oil, they were breaking the Sabbath. It was considered work. Or if you had a toothbrush and you rinsed your mouth with vinegar and you happened to swallow some of it, in which case they said it became food, that would be considered a breach of the Sabbath. So to break, for, the, for the disciples to break the Sabbath, rather than to go hungry for a few hours, was to these Pharisees a guilt worth stoning because the Jews were known all over the world for their readiness to die rather than to break the holy Sabbath day. So they thought it was a crime even to attempt, the disciples thought it was a crime even to attempt to defend themselves. And the Pharisees took great offense when they caught the disciples eating this dry cereal breakfast on the way to the synagogue. Not so much that they were taking someone's corn, because actually in the law that was permissible, but they were doing it on the Sabbath day, which was strictly forbidden by all these traditions of the religious elders. For this reason, it was a kind of reaping. It was work. And immediately, the Pharisees jumped at the opportunity, and they stopped Jesus. They didn't go to the disciples, they went to Jesus. And they complained to him of what they had seen his disciples doing, which to him was not considered work, but to them it was not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And they said, we just saw your disciples, and they were doing something that is absolutely unlawful to do on the Sabbath. What are you going to do about this? That's what they said to Jesus. So now Jesus proves to them that they are in error. And what is his answer to this false objection of these Pharisees? Let's read together verses 3 through 7 as he answers. He said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God, and he did eat the bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you know what this is, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not condemn the guiltless. You wouldn't have condemned my disciples. So the disciples could say little for themselves, especially so because the Pharisees that quarreled with them seemed to, be, seemed to have the strictness of the Sabbath sanctification on their side. But Jesus came to free his followers, not only from the corruption of the Pharisees, but from their unscriptural opposition. And he's going to speak in behalf of his disciples. And I want you to notice He's going to justify them by precedents, by rules and regulations, which were which they allowed to be good. He's going to, he's going to correct them by their own precedents, the ones that they believed themselves. And he uses an incident in David's life. David, who was one of the most eminent, most respected of the Hebrews, who in necessity did something that he shouldn't have done. And it's recorded in 1 Samuel 21, verse 6, where Jesus said to the Pharisees, haven't you read what David did? He went into God's house. He went into the tabernacle. And he and those that were with him, meaning his disciples, 
went in with them, and because they were hungry, he said, don't you remember what they did? They ate the showbread, which wasn't lawful for them to do because by law, the showbread was holy unto Aaron and his sons, only unto the priests. It was the bread that the priests put out every Sabbath day, put it out on the golden table that was in the holy place of the temple before the Lord. There were 12 loaves, each representing a tribe in Israel. And when the new loaves of freshly baked, notice, freshly baked bread were brought in, the stale loaves were taken out, taken away, but they weren't discarded. They were to be eaten by the priests and the priests only. So Jesus looked at them and he said, now he's really chiding them, he said, I'm sure that you've read the story of David about how he ate the shoe bread. Haven't you? The priests themselves gave it to David. They gave it to his, his men because they'd been running in exile from Saul and they were hungry. And Jesus didn't stop there. He went on and he said, or haven't you read in the law that the priests themselves in the temple on the Sabbath day profaned the temple and yet they were blameless? Now, I can imagine that those Pharisees about now were wide-eyed by now, wondering what Jesus was going to say next, that they didn't have any answer for. Because notice what Jesus says next. He said to them, now just in case you've forgotten what David did, just let me remind you of something else. Haven't you read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profaned it themselves, and yet they're all held blameless. Have you forgotten that the priests got up that morning and baked the fresh bread, and it was on the Sabbath that they baked it? They replaced the stale loaves with fresh baked bread. And they did all kinds of other work on the Sabbath, too like killing and flaying and burning the sacrificial beast, which of course was work, wasn't it? Profaning the Sabbath, and you've forgotten yet? And Jesus said, and yet you call them blameless? Of course, when the, when the priest uh, did labor, they did labor. They baked and they removed the stale show bread with new loaves. They prepared sacrifices. They performed all the other temple services. And therefore, if all labor on the Sabbath profaned the Sabbath, like the Pharisees maintained, well, what were the priests doing? They were profaning the Sabbath, too. Continually, they were continually guilty, guilty of profaning the Sabbath because they probably did more work on the Sabbath in preparing all those sacrifices, plus all their other temple duties, than any other day. And yet, they weren't accused of breaking the law. They were called blameless. Why? Because the Pharisees held that duties of the temple service set aside the law of the Sabbath of rest. Why? Because this labor on the part of a few was necessary for the true keeping of the law. Their whole motive was to keep the law, nothing else, while they didn't acknowledge at all anything else. Ceremonial duties must give way to moral and spiritual duties so that the law of love must take the place of ritual observances. But they didn't do this. A simple illustration is this. We would say that it was wrong to do ordinary repair work on your car, you know, on Sunday, that you could do other days of just ordinary repair work. We would say that that was wrong. But if you're on your way to church and you have a flat tire, it wouldn't be a sin to change the tire so that you could be on your way to the place of worship. But the Pharisees would regard this as breaking the Sabbath. But again, the error that they had was that they could they cared more for the letter of the law than for the spirit. 
They care more for outward appearances than for spiritual principles and inner worship of the heart. They put sacrifice above mercy. And they misinterpreted Jesus' words to find opportunity to accuse him. Not to learn anything from his holy lessons and the things he was teaching his disciples. That wasn't their motive. And Jesus rebuked them very strongly. Now listen to him. He says, I say unto you that in this place is one that's even greater than the temple. And this means that I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And this means, Jesus said to them, that if you know what it means to be merciful, you wouldn't be standing here condemning my disciples. You would be sorry that they had to do this because they were hungry, and you wouldn't be condemning the guiltless. He said, you see, it's not enough to just know what the scriptures say. We have to know, and he's saying that to us today, and I say this to the church, it's not enough that you know what the scriptures say. You have to know the meaning of them. Uh, the word of, in, in the word of God, it says, let him that readeth understand. You'll have to understand and put it into practice. So here Jesus says to the Pharisees, you don't understand what I mean when I tell you that in this place is one greater than the temple. So you worship by keeping laws and ritual. So let me explain to you. And let's read verse 8 together as he explains. All he says is, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Jesus said this to them, meaning that the law as well as all of the rest is put in his hands by God to be, to be altered, to be in, enforced, or to be dispersed with, as he says here. It was by the Son that God made the world. And as mediator, as Jesus being mediator, he's entrusted with the institution of all the ordinances, and he can make any changes that he sees fit. He's given that liberty by Father God, particularly as being the Lord of the Sabbath. And so now he's only exer exercising the authority that God the Father had given him to make any changes or any alterations of that day that he might see fit. He called it the Lord's Day. And he's going to change it soon after this, soon after his resurrection. He's going to change it, making the first day of the week, Sunday, the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. And so, by virtue of this power, Jesus enacts the works of charity, and he calls them works of mercy and necessity. And, and, and he says, tells them what is lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Well, the Pharisees exalted the Sabbath in a way that absolutely destroyed its meaning. They esteemed nothing greater than the temple except God, who was worshipped in it. But here, Jesus actually asserts something. He asserts that he is greater than that temple. Actually, he asserts that he is God. That's what he's saying here. He says, he's saying he is God by saying, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Thereby the institutor, the regulator, and the governor of it. And so he presents himself here as the creator of the Sabbath. And never did he ever abolish, never did he lessen the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Mercy was the exception that God set up over and against rigid, pharisaical adherence to the law. And Jesus corrects them. He only removed, he didn't do away with it, he only removed the rubbish that the Pharisees had brought into it and is still to be a day of rest and worship, a day of physical rest, a day of spiritual rest, by declaring the New Testament, and this is in Mark 2.27, where he declared the Sabbath was made for man, 
not man, for the Sabbath. It's to be a day of rest and worship. A day of physical rest from the ordinary work that you can do in six days. And a day of spiritual rest by worshiping and doing acts of charity for the welfare of others. Mercy is the exception. It's not a day for us to lay around or do whatever we want to entertain ourselves. It's not a day to do whatever I want to do. No. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, not man to do what he wanted to do, to entertain himself. Well, this is absolutely science silenced the Pharisees. They had nothing more to say. So we're told that Jesus simply departed from him and continued on his way to the synagogue now. And his disciples went along with him. So let's read verses 9 through 10 and see what happened at the synagogue. And when, when he, was he was departed thence, he went, he went into their synagogue. And, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? that they might accuse him. Now notice, this was their synagogue. They called it their synagogue. He called it their synagogue. The synagogue of those men who'd been dogging his steps, who just accused his disciples and, and were its rulers and elders. Their synagogue. And notice also, Jesus wasn't like some people who stop attending church because someone has stepped on their toes or dressed like they think should like they thought they shouldn't be dressing. Someone has offended them. He, he, he didn't do that. He just met up with them out there and they accused him. That didn't keep him from going to church. Sometimes that's what keeps people from attending church if they get offended. But just notice Jesus' example here. So he wasn't offended. And no, more, no, no personal motives should ever, ever be allowed to keep any of, of us from church either, to influence our thoughts when, or to influence our thoughts while we're there. Jesus wasn't detoured. He went right into their temple, right into those who constantly argued and accused him falsely. And in the congregation on that day, there was a man with a withered hand. It just hung down at his side. It was useless. So that he was totally, utterly disabled from making a living for himself. And Jerome says that the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew, used by the Nazarenes, adds this information concerning this man. He said he was a bricklayer by trade, but now he was unable to work any longer. And here he is in the synagogue. And again, the Pharisees used this as an opportunity to contend with Jesus, to provoke controversy, not to promote compassion, which they knew that Jesus could not help but show forth when he looked at this man. So they used this poor man as a guinea pig, forgetting completely this poor man's feelings and all the anxiety that they're calling attention to him and his withered hand would cause him. They didn't care about that. So they asked Jesus a question. They said, now, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? It was a spiteful question because they knew they'd observed Christ. They knew his good. They knew that any opportunity he had, he was going to reach out and heal and do good. So he, they used this case as a stumbling block in the way of his doing good. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they could accuse him because they knew what he was going to do. So their work of hearts were full of malice in the very house of God, which they proclaimed to honor. They sought to ensnare Jesus, to destroy him. He did nothing but good. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They weren't asking to get any inst instruction from him. Uh, but they used it as an opportunity to accuse him. They were blinded by hatred. They didn't understand that no desecration of the Sabbath is worse in the sight of God than evil 
thoughts or malicious ideas. No crime could be worse than their trying to bring about the death of one most holy, most merciful, and on the day which God had hallowed, one who had even manifested himself to them as the Son of God. And so now Jesus answers them. Read verses 11 through 13 with me. And he, he said, said unto them, them What man shall bring among you that shall have one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? It out? How, How much is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. days. Then say ye to the man, Stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, white as the other. Jesus answers questions with questions, doesn't he? So often. He answers one question by asking another. And here he answers their question by making them appeal to themselves and their own practices and their own opinions, would they not save a sheep from danger on the Sabbath? No doubt they would, because the fourth command, that they had allowed it, saying, a merciful man regards the life of his beast. And for their part, yes, they would. They'd save the sheep. Rather than lose, him, or lose a sheep, they'd save it. And doesn't Christ, doesn't Jesus take care of his sheep? Yes, he does. He preserves, he provides for both man and beast. So here Jesus argues, how much more then is a man better than a sheep? Now we know sheep are not only harmless, but they're very useful animals. And yet as, as man here is preferred before them, much better and more valuable than the best of animals because man is capable of knowing, loving, and glorifying God. And even the sacrifice of a sheep couldn't, couldn't atone for the sin of a soul. Therefore, man is better than sheep. But the Pharisees didn't consider this. They admitted, and yeah, Jesus had power to heal the sick. They couldn't deny this. They never did question his ability to perform miracles because they saw him with their own eyes. So that was never their question. Uh, therefore, they would acknowledge also that when a helpless man was placed in his pathway, he would be moved with compassion to heal him. They would have to acknowledge that, even on the Sabbath. They knew that. So now, I, I just as I, as I was studying this, do you suppose that maybe this man with the withered hand, do you, do you think that maybe he was planted there in the temple deliberately by the Pharisees to trap Jesus into healing him because they knew that that's what he was going to do so that they could accuse him of working on the Sabbath? But the crux of the whole matter was, should he do well on the Sabbath? And they had asked, is it lost, lawful to heal? So Jesus proves that it is lawful to do well, and it was up to them to judge whether healing, as he did, was doing well or not. Well, I, 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 years ago, I, as a nurse, I, most of my time, I always had to work on weekends, um, every other weekend. And I was questioned sometimes by my co-laborers if I was a Christian, why I would work on Sunday. And, and I, I had reservations about it, but I, I got into this and I studied this. And um, this was my answer as Jesus answered it here. Um, I learned that there, are more, that, that there are more ways of doing well on the Sabbath and they're more important. They're more important than some other things. And that what I was doing as a nurse, caring for people and sick people, was doing well on the Sabbath. There are more ways of doing well than worshiping in the house of God. Helping the poor, helping those who are falling into sudden distress and need immediate relief, attending the sick, that's important. Just as important to Jesus as coming into his house and worshiping. This is doing good from the principle of love, 
and charity with humility and self-denial. And our Heavenly Father is, acknowledges that. He calls it doing well, and he will accept it. Because not to do good when it lies within our power is to do evil. And that's what Mark, Mark says in his gospel in the third chapter in the fourth verse. Therefore, it's not only lawful, but sometimes it's our duty to do works of mercy on the Sabbath. These Pharisees were so stiff-necked, they were so hardened in their hearts by their miserable formalism. Jesus was grieved. Jesus was angry. So, notwithstanding the offense which he foresaw that the Pharisees would take, even though they couldn't answer his arguments and they were resolved to continue and persist in their hatred and their prejudice, Jesus went over to the man. He just walked over to him. The man didn't go to Jesus. He didn't say a word. Jesus walked over to him and he said, stretch forth thine hand. Now, there are two things that happened here that I don't want us to miss. They're very important. I want you to notice. This man did not say a word. He had no part himself in this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. He'd only come to the temple to worship. And Jesus went to him. Secondly, not only did Jesus approach him without his asking for any help, Jesus said to him, stretch forth your hand. Exert yourself. Now how in the world could this man stretch forth his hand? It was withered. It was hanging down limp by his side. It was useless. And he's supposed to just walk over to Jesus and stretch out his hand? He couldn't do this of himself anymore then the impotent man could arise and carry his bed and go home. Or that Lazarus could come up forth out of his grave. But Jesus bid him to do it. And there was a work of mercy to be done here. And this man, this man believed Jesus. He believed the word of the Lord. He believed it. And with that command, there was grace and mercy. And somehow, he stretched forth his withered hand, and it was restored whole, just like the other one. He never said a word. He hadn't gone to Jesus. Jesus went to him. All he did was obey that command. He believed the word of the Lord, and he willed to stretch forth his withered hand. And the muscles that were helpless before obeyed the command of the will. His hand was restored because he believed the word of the Lord. That's the key. Believe the word of the Lord. Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath day. Did he break the law? What do you think? I don't think he did. And now this marks the break between the religious leaders and Jesus. Let's finish our lesson and read together verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out, held a council on Jesus, and how they might destroy him. How they might kill him. So here's where the religious leaders just decided now that they're going to kill him. The Pharisees were filled with madness. Luke says in chapter 6, the 11th verse, they were filled with a wicked folly, and they took counsel against him. He had shamed them. He would put them to silence, and yet he'd done nothing which could be used as a grounds of accusations against him. He didn't do anything. He just spoke the word. He didn't do any kind of word. He just spoke the word. But they were vexed, and they were angered, and they were enraged, not only by his miracles, but by the doctrine that he preached. It was directly opposite to their pride and their hypocrisy, to their worldly interests. But they pretended to be displeased at breaking the Sabbath day, which was by their law, the capital crime. And that's no new thing. To see the vilest practices cloaked with religion, it's still being done today. The Pharisees could use the Sabbath to plot against Jesus' life. That was all right. Yet they considered it unlawful for him to heal on the Sabbath. And he did no work, he just spoke the word. That's hypocrisy. But when Jesus knew it, 
he withdrew, but only temporarily because his hour hadn't yet come. They couldn't touch him until the appointed time. So he simply withdrew himself, and it tells us that great multitudes followed after him. So the Pharisees were far more critical than God intended them to be. The Sabbath was not a day of restrictions alone. It was a day of rest also. And today, there's much desecration of the Sabbath day through buying and selling. Our stores are open. When I grew up as a child, they were never open. Today, the stores are open. They probably make more money on Sunday than any other day. They're crowded. There's much pleasure seeking on Sunday. Look at the soccer fields. Not now, because you can't go in them, but normally they would be full of our young people, our children on Sunday, and the baseball parks would be full. Pleasure seeking, working, staying out of church. Some people think that Sunday is fun day. Not so. We must remember that the Sabbath was not given for the purpose of giving Christians the liberty to do whatever they please. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man to worship God and do, do duties of, of charity. And the true child of God doesn't need any special rules to keep him from violating the Sabbath because he desires to keep it holy by attending the house of God and refraining from any unnecessary work, work that could be done the other six days of the week, and from keeping themselves, disciplining themselves, from pleasure-seeking and buying and selling on that day. It's the day that Jesus rose from the grave upon. It's a Resurrection Sunday. It's, that's the Lord's Day now for a New Testament Christian. The first day of the week, the day that's set aside for man to worship, to preach, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the day of the week that Jesus obtained victory over death. Therefore, it has preeminence and is more honorable than ever the Jewish Sabbath was. So let's regard it as lawful to do well on the Sabbath. That's what Jesus taught. Father, we thank you for your word this day. And I pray, God, that, that we would, it, it would burn in our hearts and we would assess ourselves and we would discipline ourselves. And not only that, but we would be good examples to our children, our children's children, and to this evil world in this day. Let's remember to keep the Sabbath holy, to attend worship, and to do these charitable deeds, acts of mercy, which God does not consider work on the Sabbath. He considers it as part of keeping his Sabbath holy. Thank you, Father God, for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.